Released in 1997 by Interplay Production, the original Fallout is seen by many as the first modern role-playing game. It was a huge financial success and laid the foundation for one of the most iconic franchises in gaming. And I just don't get it, because the first Fallout game I played was Fallout 4 in 2018. All of this just works. It was aggressively mediocre like the other modern Bethesda games. So I thought, surely that wasn't all the legendary Fallout has to offer, right? To answer my own question, I decided to play Fallout 1 to see what it was all about. And I have to say, I get it. Let's go back to 1997 to witness the birth of a gaming titan and figure out why we rarely get games like this anymore. But before we start, thank you for watching. The genre of games that we call RPG, or role-playing game, has existed since the 1970s. After a long period of stagnation, the rise of PC gaming in the late 90s brought forth the revival of the genre. Leading the charge of this was Fallout, a B project from Interplay Production. Fallout was created because I was playing with engines, and then I bought some pizza and invited people to come talk about settings after hours. There were a lot of other projects at Interplay that were better funded, had bigger teams, and were prioritized in the internal uh, pipelines above Fallout. The game missed several release dates and was finally available for purchase on the 9th of October 1997. Though Fallout didn't meet internal sales expectation, it quickly developed a huge fan base. By March 2000, the game has sold 144,000 copies in the US alone. To put into perspective, in a current population report by the US Department of Commerce issued in September 2001, about 51% of all American households had a computer. That's roughly 50 million computers, and if we assume that each sold Fallout copy was installed on one computer, then for every 1000 computers there were about 3 with Fallout installed. Point is, the game was a big deal, especially among RPG fans. Fallout was a one-of-a-kind game even for its genre. Except for the game Wasteland, most RPGs back then took place in a fantasy setting. Tim Kaine, a creator of the original Fallout, said in his Fallout development timeline video that Fallout was gonna be about an alternative timeline where aliens invade Earth and humans have to hide in underground vaults. Through many discussions, the team went with a post-apocalyptic America while still keeping the underground vaults idea. In 2077, the storm of World War had come again. In two brief hours, most of the planet was reduced to cinders. And from the ashes of nuclear devastation, a new civilization would struggle to arise. A few were able to reach the relative safety of the large underground vaults. Your family was part of that group that entered Vault 13. Imprisoned safely behind the large vault door under a mountain of stone, a generation has lived without knowledge of the outside world. The setting is perfect, it puts the player and their character in the same position where they know very little about the world. But we're gonna find out about the world real soon, because the vault needs a new water chip. And we were chosen to find it outside in the great unknown. I think you're the only hope we have. You need to go find us another controller chip. Looks like someone got a bad case of the Monday. All great adventures start with fighting rats, so let's chat a bit about the unique story of Fallout when I'm doing some extermination in the background. Fallout has a very simple story compared to other role-playing games. The entire game can be finished in 10 hours or just a few minutes if you can do speedrun. Because of the world design, the story quests are very far apart from one another. As we get around, we find quests and resolve them with a decision that would leave a lasting effect on the community there. This enables the players to tell their own stories with the given assets. Instead of a story-driven experience, it's a player-driven story. This idea was very revolutionary, and not only for its time. And with that, the last ride is dealt with. Time to find that chip. When we arrive at the hub, not that one, this one, we stumble upon a massive conspiracy in the wasteland. Well, some caravans have been disappearing on us lately. Some say it's the Death Claw. But I don't know nothing about that. Merchant caravans have gone missing in huge numbers, while super mutants are popping up like mushrooms. Because it was like someone went bargain shopping at Mutant Land. Whew, cheaper by the dozens. Can't figure any other reason except that being the factory. After some choices and consequences, we secured the water chip and the survival of our vault. Except there's a new threat on the horizon. 
It looks like someone's generating new mutants, and at a startling rate. The mutants might find out about the vault, so we must stop them. It was getting stuffy in there anyway. Turns out there really is a facility where these super mutants are created. It's a military base, doubled as a research facility for the Force Evolution Virus, a pre-war bioweapon. Originally, it was used to create super soldiers for the American army, but the nuclear hellfire put the operation on hold. Some times later, an expedition led by one Richard Gray made its way into the deepest part of the compound. Richard Gray was a doctor. A little older than me, and Fran was he smart. We mounted an expedition. Richard Gray led a small group of us up there. In an accident, he fell into one of the vats containing the virus. A robot crane crashed into us. Last I saw Gray, he was flying through the air and into some sort of acid bath. His long exposure caused the most radical mutations, granting him superhuman abilities. Inspired by this, he planned to turn all of mankind into mutants in the very same manner. This unity will rid humans of all differences and thus stopping all wars and conflicts. The unity will bring about the master race. Master. Master. One able to survive or even thrive in the wasteland. As long as there are differences, we will tear ourselves apart fighting each other. We need one race. 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 One goal. 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 One people to move forward to our destiny. Destiny. So the created mutants, now under Richard's command, kidnapped merchants and exposed them to the virus to increase their numbers. However, this had some side effects to say the very least. The Wastelanders' long exposure to radiation tampers with the mutation, turning them into dumb mutants. Hey, you not look like ghoul. But that's only a minor flaw in Richard's plan. Besides being stupid, the mutants are also sterile. All the mutants I've studied have been sterile. They can't breed with another creature. If we could clean up the mutation sources, we should be able to simply outlive the mutants. I was wondering why there were no mutant babies running around. If Richard spent less time reading and more time banging, he might remember to check the fertility of his master race. In case we have this information and high enough speech skill, we can, with the power of 1,000 Asian parents, convince him that his work was a failure. This would mean that all oh, my work has been for nothing. Everything that I've tried to a, a failure, it can't be. be. Out of shame and regret, Richard would blow himself up after letting us go. Leave now. Leave while you still have hope. That's right, New Vegas wasn't the first game where you can beat the last boss by yapping. Or we could just go with the traditional bullet to head method. Or head? Even the VAT system is confused here. This is the most challenging fight in the game. The master has a lot of health and an unholy amount of damage. With the base destroyed and the master defeated, Ron Perman once again graces us with his beautiful narration. You managed to destroy the VATs. Then you killed the master before he could realize his twisted plans. With the master gone, his armies flee to the east in fear of retribution from the remaining normals. The ending slides go through our decisions in the game and how those would affect the societies in the wasteland. And those achievements have sealed our re-entry into the vault. You're a hero and you have to leave. The Overseer now sees us as a threat to the new generation of old dwellers because of our knowledge and stories. So once again, we head out into the desert, now our second home and disappear into the sand. The song Maybe slowly picks up where it left off during the intro. Before the phrase War. War never changes. Become a catchy zinger for marketing, it was the perfect encapsulation of what Fallout is. Conflict has always been in our nature, and throughout history it manifested in many forms. In the game, this readiness for violence was explored through many conflict across the wasteland. Our first encounter with conflict was when the Khans kidnapped the daughter of Aradesh, the elder of Shady Sands. Thank goodness you came. I am in desperate need of assistance. My daughter Tandy is missing. I do not know what to do. We can save her, and in doing so putting an end to the Khans' presence in the region. It's a very clear-cut conflict, black and white if you will. The Khans are raiders, they harass merchants and settlers. Us killing them would only have a positive impact on the game world. On a meta level, killing the whole raider camp benefits us a lot. A huge amount of XP, money and ammo would guarantee us a very pleasant early game. So, from a value assessment and a moral perspective, we are totally justified to fight and destroy the Khans. Please keep this in mind.
The next conflict, if we go by the normal route, would be in Junk Town. The moment we arrive at Junk Town, we're thrown right into a power struggle. Listen, thanks for saving my life. It's a mighty brave thing to do. There are two factions vying for control over the small town, one led by Killian Darkwater, the town's mayor, and Gizmo, a casino owner. Now instead of rescuing a damsel in distress, we're confronted with local politics. Oh! If we side with Killian and take down Gizmo, Junktown would be rid of its criminal problem, but also crippled financially. Junktown was built from wreckages of nearby ruins, so having its casino shut down would hinder the growth of the community by decades. But if we choose to side with Gizmo and finishing the job on Killian, Junktown will turn into a criminal haven. The conflict has taken on new colors, and now the choice isn't so clear anymore. Do we hold on to order while being destitute, or do we prioritize growth over everything else? Whatever we choose, it would end with a fight that results in one of the faction leaders' death. The third time we face another conflict is in the hub. This time, the motive is however much more trivial. Decker, the owner of the Maltese Falcon Casino, has some jobs for us if we're willing to do them. They pay really well and aren't very hard if we have the necessary firepower. That's right, if you want, you can do a series of assassination for an unholy amount of money. And that's not the end. When we conclude the jobs, we can then double-cross Decker by snitching him out to the Sheriff. If we survive the raid of the Falcon, that's another huge amount of XP, gears and ammo. The conflict here is purely motivated by selfish reasons. The victims of Deckers never wronged us, in fact we don't even know who they are. A random merchant in the heights, a priestess downtown, all of these people were merely a name with a bullet attached to them. And when we eventually sell out Decker, it was not a moral decision either, it was just good business. The last and biggest conflict in the game is the fight with the master. This conflict transcends all the other ones as it directly decides the survival of us and everyone else in the wasteland. The master, fueled by his vision of peace through unity in mutation, was threatening the very existence of mankind as we know it. Once again, we have a choice. We can oppose him and kill him, ending his legacy right then and there. Or we can surrender to him if we are convinced by his ideals and give up the location of our vault. Lastly, if we join the Brotherhood first, we can acquire the knowledge of the plan's critical flaw and point it out to him. As you can see, it always comes back to war. Even after a thousand years of bloodshed and a nuclear hellfire, we still couldn't help but fight ourselves. But I really liked the commentary Fallout made. It didn't demonize or glorify violence or war. It simply presents those things as they are and let us come to our own conclusions. To me, this is the game saying that war and violence are, have always been and will always be a part of our existence. It's up to us to define our relationship with it. We can let it take over and become savage raiders. Use it to satisfy selfish desires like money or power, or wield it to protect others who can't do so for themselves. But whatever we use to rationalize it, wars are still wars, and they never change. Fallout is a damn hard game. My first Fallout game was Fallout 4, then New Vegas, and Fallout 1. It's wild how these three games can belong in the same franchise. Now I'm not a turn-based rookie, I've had my fair share of missed attacks and rolling no damage, but man, Fallout is still the most brutal one. This difficulty doesn't come from complexity. One of the YouTubers I often watch, Warlockcracy, said that Fallout 1 is called that because it has one build. When I first heard it, I went, yeah right, but then I played the game and he was right. There's only one build in Fallout that is miserable to play, and it's dumping everything into agility. This stat dictates how fast our character moves compared to other combatants and how high our chance to land a ranged attack is. Fallout is not a game where you can do a social build. There are fights that you have to go through, and they would end very quickly if you're not prepared. When it comes to fighting, agility makes the combat so much more enjoyable. I know that missing attacks is a part of the turn-based experience, but my sanity can only take so many you miss before I start losing it. Trust me, I have tried so many other ways to play, and agility is the only way to not feel like an uncoordinated noodle doing a fight. But the combat really makes up for the lack of build diversity. For a game from 1997, the combat of Fallout still holds up to the modern RPG market. It's no wonder why so many video games got their inspiration from Fallout. The combat system is designed to be intuitive. The moment a fight starts, the game comes to a pause. We can see our action points here, and a window opens for us to end turn or exit combat, if that's an option. From here, we have a few choices. There are two weapon slots available to us at all time. Depending on the weapon, we can choose between shooting it normally, using the alternative fire mode, or using VATS to aim for a specific part with extra cost. 
On top of that, moving around also costs action points, and the hit chance scales inversely with our distance to the target. Every fight is an intense puzzle. Do we sacrifice damage to get closer for a guaranteed hit, or try our luck to roll for a critical hit from a distance? This system is very easy to learn and master once you understand the core of it, but no game is perfect and that includes Fallout as well. As I stated earlier, the lack of build diversity makes replaying the game not very interesting despite its small size. But I don't think it's a design problem, rather it's a time issue combined with technical limitation. As Tim Kaine said in his video, the team missed the release dates for Fallout multiple times due to software issues. I believe time constraint was also a factor in limiting the team from expanding alternative playstyle like stealth or social builds. And the last thing that was so iconic about Fallout was the aesthetic. While other games were chasing a high fantasy vision, Fallout went with the post-apocalyptic world. This setting opens the door for so many cool ideas of what societies after the world's end look like. We get everything from diet space marine to Scientologists with less money. The potential truly is endless. And I've always been a style over graphic person so Fallout was like a wonderland for me. Having the desert wasteland as the background is perfect for structures to stand out. The shacks of Junk Town, the mud houses of Shady Sands, each location has its own vibe. You can understand a society just by looking at their settlement. The ghouls in Necropolis aren't humans anymore and don't really care about the nice tidy living space, but the Brotherhood of Steel covered their bunker with high-tech equipments because they see themselves as the guardians of humanity's technology. Shady Sands is a primitive settlement because they built their houses out of muds. Junk Town is a small humble town so their houses are made out of metal sheets put together. The hub is a melting pot of the wasteland with a commercial district, a bougie neighborhood and an actual slum. Shout out to my boy Harold. The game was excellent in show and then tell with its art. The game is not just fun to look at but immersive as well. Anywhere I went to I never had the feeling like oh I'm in a game. For an isometric game with this sort of movement the sound design and art has me totally hooked. In the LA bunker, each floor I went down my heart beat faster, and when I stared down the hallway leading to the master, I was in there with a the vault dweller, sweating in the power armor. I can sit here and gush about the game all day, but you have to play it to truly get it. The last thing I want to touch on is the legacy of Fallout. Before the acquisition by Bethesda, the game Fallout and the franchise set the standard for the RPG genre. Concepts like non-linear storytelling, choices and consequences were realized by Fallout and they still remain a staple for the role-playing games. It also opened the door for other settings in the RPG genre, because for the longest time it was dominated by fantasy. For once there were no dwarves, elves, orcs and other fantastical races, just humans being horrible to each other. Fallout also pioneered this new sort of fusion aesthetic, where many motifs fit together despite being worlds apart. This is probably the only franchise where cowboys, tribals, super soldiers with power armor, cultists and mutant with rockets can inhabit the same desert. And it feels totally authentic. You wanna know when an aesthetic is forced? Look at Neon in Starfield, or the cowboy planet where one of the companions is from. The difference between a theme park and an immersive environment is sufficient world building with a coherent vision. Playing Fallout makes me think about the state of gaming quite a bit. The idea that single player games are a relic of the past or they are out of fashion is totally out of touch. Myself and many others could still find enjoyment in a single player game from 27 years ago. A well made single player game still holds up after 3 decades but a soulless subpar product won't make it past 2 weeks. I really like a quote from Josh Sawyer, one of the minds behind Fallout New Vegas, saying that fan of single player games never left, the publishers did. And looking at the trends in gaming for the last 2 decades, this statement can't be more true. Each time a great game comes out, it puts the spotlight on a whole genre. In the 2000s it's cover shooter because of Halo, in the 2010s it's battle royale thanks to PUBG and Fortnite, and now the new hot thing is live service. Each time a new hot thing hits the market, a whole wave of similar products follows suit and when the well runs dry, the latecomers get shafted. Meanwhile, every single player game that were made with love and care was celebrated and became financial successes. As a single game enjoyer, gaming has never been more fun for me. While others were putting their life savings into JPEGs or grind a battle pass like a second job, I just chill in my man cave playing games made for me. It feels really good being the target audience for once. And lastly, Fallout is not le capitalism bad Twitter. Play the damn game if you want to misunderstand it at least. Anyways, the video has gone on long enough. Fallout is an amazing game even after all these years, please go give it a try. If you liked the video, consider giving that subscribe button a nice smack, it really helps the channel. If you were there when Fallout came out, please share your experience in the comments, I love ancient history. Have a good day, I'll see you guys in the next one, alright bye!